Welcome to another episode of the Understanding Crypto series on YouTube. Uh, today we're going to take a look at the Money and Payments Central Bank Digital Currency Research Paper that the Federal Reserve recently released, where they talk about the U.S. dollar and the age of digital transformation. Uh, this paper came out just a couple days ago, um, so let's take a look at it. Um, you can download it from federalreserve.gov, publications, files, money and payments, uh, 2022, uh, 20, 201.20.pdf. All right, so let's take a look at it. Um, you know, they, they do a little brief introduction on the Federal Reserve. They talk about the fact that the Federal Reserve System is the central bank of the United States. It performs several key functions to promote the effective operation of the U.S. economy. You know, it conducts the nation's monetary policy, promotes stability of the financial system, promotes safety and soundness of individual financial institutions, fosters payment and settlement systems, safety and efficiency for the banking industry, and promotes consumer protection and consumer community development. So the Federal Reserve is not a bank that an individual opens up an account with, but rather it's a bank for banks. It helps the banking system in the U.S. and abroad to do payments with U.S. banks. All right, uh, let's take a look at the contents of this document. There's an executive summary, uh, which is the first couple of pages, covers the background, key topics, and also talks about public outreach, which we'll get into in a minute. Then there's an introduction, which takes a couple of pages, and they talk about current existing forms of net money, uh, you know, non cryptocurrency, basically. Then they talk about the payment system and some recent improvements to the payment system, as well as current challenges for the payment system. Then they start diving into cryptocurrency with the section on digital assets. And then they talk about this concept of a central bank digital currency or a CBDC. And this is really the main focus of the paper, you know, talking about what would be the purpose of a central bank digital currency. You know, should the US government offer something like Bitcoin to citizens and banks? You know, and it's possible that. Um, the U.S. government could use cryptocurrency in its operations with other banks between the, the Federal Reserve and the individual banks without actually making these currencies available to individuals. And so they talk about the different possible uses and functions of a central bank digital currency, as well as what the benefits and risks are. And then they uh, close with seeking comments from others saying, hey, this is our perspective. What do you think about this? Please feel free to comment on it. Um, and then we've got an appendix that talks about what they're currently doing research on in, in digital cryptocurrencies, because several different units within the Federal Reserve are doing currently doing research on how these currencies would work if they decide to go down this path. Uh, and then they talk about different types of money and access to money and payment services, and then a list of references. All right, so this is the contents for this paper. I am not going to read through this paper word for word. Uh, I've shown you where the URL is, you know. You, you can go read this on your own, but I will take a quick look at some of the different contents in this paper so we can take a look at what's going on. So we'll just scroll down here. Uh, here's the executive summary, you know, just saying, hey, this is a high level paper talking about uh, the concept for central bank digital currencies in general, as well as what would be the benefits and risks for the US to create one. Um, and they want to point out that this paper doesn't advance a specific policy outcome nor does it indicate that the Federal Reserve is going to make any decisions soon about whether or not to issue a U.S. central bank digital currency. And in fact, later in this paper, they mentioned that uh, it would be useful to have Congress's input before the Federal Reserve does act in this space. Um, they give the background. You know, there are a wide range of payment technologies that have been offered uh, with the development of computational systems and the Internet. Uh, in the 1970s, the Federal Reserve developed the automated clearinghouse ACH system for an electronic alternative to paper checks. Uh, currently, the Federal Reserve is building the FedNow service for real time around the clock for bank payments. Uh, and there's this wave of cryptocurrency technology in the private sector, digital wallets, mobile payment assets, and so on, stable coins. And this is leading central bank to, uh, the, the central bank to consider the concept of the CBDC. Um, and the Federal Reserve actually has been studying this topic for several years. 
uh, because actually central banks around the world have been studying this topic for several years because of all the interest and excitement in the cryptocurrency space. The central banks are looking at how it could benefit them, you know, benefits for households, businesses, the overall economy. You know, is it more efficient to use a cryptocurrency than some of our traditional tools? Or is it something that would replace or complement the existing tools? Um, and again, uh, throughout this, they want to watch, look, take a look at the risks. You know, you want to continue to protect consumer privacy. Even if you move to a new technology, you don't want to open up things um, that were private in the past. You also want to protect against criminal activity and have broad support from the key stakeholders. And so they talk about the various topics. You know, specifically, this paper is looking at uh, you know, they want a central bank digital currency to be privacy protected, a widely transferable identity verified. Um, you know, that's sort of their goals. They also took a look at different digital assets that are out there, including stable coins, as well as volatile cryptocurrencies, like Bitcoin. Uh, and then they talked about the uses and functions of a central bank digital currency and so on. Um, and again, one of the key aspects, because this is a government agency, they want to, uh, input from a wide range of stakeholders that would be impacted by a central bank digital currency to give them ideas to, you know, how they could best proceed. All right, so the introduction of the paper is really going to talk about the fact that uh, what, what is a central bank digital currency? So they define it as a digital liability of the Federal Reserve. It's widely available to the public, uh, general public. Um, so they're actually defining it as a broadly available cryptocurrency here, uh, as opposed to something that would only be used by other banks. Um, then they go in and talk about the fact that uh, uh, while there's long been electronic money in bank accounts, uh, the central bank digital currency would differ tremendously because it'd be a liability of the Federal Reserve, not a commercial bank. They talk about the fact it could provide a, a range of benefits, uh, safety and liquidity, convenient electronic uh, and efficient currency, faster and cheaper payments, in particular cross border payments are a key issue that uh, cryptocurrency has been used for in the past and may be used for uh, as, as, by, as a central bank digital currency. However, there are some risks and there are important policy questions as to how this new uh, type of money would impact the financial sector. Uh, you know, the cost and availability of credit, the safety and stability of the financial system, and the effectiveness of monetary po uh, policy. Uh, so it would be a significant innovation in the American monetary system. And so they want to have broad consultation with the general public and key stakeholders before taking any steps in this area. Uh, and, then, and that's the last comment they make is the Federal Reserve does not intend to proceed with issuing a central bank digital currency without clear support from the executive branch from Congress, ideally in the form of a specific authorizing law. Now notice this ideally, that means that they'd like to see a law authorizing them to do this, but because they put ideally there, it means that they might actually do this without having legislation. So let's take a look at the existing, uh, the next topic, which is just a review of the existing forms of money. They talk about central bank money being a liability to the central bank. Commercial bank money is a digital form of money that's most commonly used by the public, held at money held in commercial banks. And non-bank money is digital money held at balances at non-bank financial service providers, um, like mobile apps. Uh, and the different types of money have different am uh, amounts of credit and liquidity risk. Uh, commercial bank money has very little credit liquidity liquidity risk due to the FDIC insurance uh, and the supervision regulation of commercial banks and commercial banks access to central bank liquidity. Non-bank money lacks the full range of protections of the commercial bank money and generally carries more credit and liquidity risk. And then central bank money has neither of those risks and is therefore the central safest form of money. Um, and it's the foundation of the financial system and the overall economy. Uh, commercial bank money and non-bank money are generally denominated in the same units of central bank money in U.S. dollars and are intended to be convertible into central bank money. Uh, the next section talks about the payment system. Uh, the U.S. payment system connects a broad range of financial institutions, households, and businesses. Most payments in the U.S. rely on interbank payment services such as the ACH network or wire transfer systems to move money from a center's account at one bank to a recipient's account at another bank. 
Uh, interbank payment systems are critical to the functioning and stability of the financial system and the economy in general. Uh, the firms that operate interbank payment services are subject to federal supervision and heightened supervision and regulation. Interbank payment systems may initially settle in commercial bank money or in central bank money, depending on their design. Uh, but they, central bank payment systems tend to underpin the interbank systems and serve as a backbone of the payment system. There have been some recent improvements to the payment system, uh, focused on making payments faster, cheaper, and more accessible. Uh, instant payments have been a particularly active field of private and public sector innovation. Uh, the Clearinghouse has developed the RTP network, which is a real-time payment uh, banking payment system for low-value payments. Federal Reserve is also building a new interbank settlement service called FedNow, which is supposed to be launched in 2023. Uh, these instant payment systems are enabled commercial banks to provide payment system services around the clock every day of the year with immediate access to transferred funds. Uh, and these growth of these instant payment systems could also reduce the costs and fees associated with certain types of payments. Um, and there's a variety of different consumer-focused services that are accessible to mobile devices that have made digital payments faster and more convenient. However, some of these mobile uh, systems may have various risks. There are, however, some still uh, are some challenges to the payment system. Uh, even though the payment system is generally effective and efficient, uh, there are uh, in Americans and others who currently lack access to digital banking and payment services, and cross-border payments remain slow and costly. Uh, more than 5% of U.S. households don't have bank accounts. Um, nearly 20% more have bank accounts but rely on extremely costly financial services, such as money orders, check cashing services, and payday loans. Uh, a variety of public and private sector efforts are underway to support uh, financial services for those who are at risk. Uh, for example, the private sector bank on initiatives promotes low cost, low risk consumer checking accounts. Um, cross border payments have a number of challenges, including so set slow settlement, high fees, limited accessibility. The source of these frictions includes the mechanics of currency exchange, variations in different countries, legal regulations, and technology, time zone complications, coordination problems among intermediaries and intermediaries, and so on. Um, allowing existing providers to charge high fees for cross-border payments. The average cost of sending a payment from the United States to other countries uh, was 5.41% of the value of the transaction in 2021. However, that's an average. There are some payments that are much higher in the fees. You know, there are pay cross-border payments where they're charging 20% or more to send uh, the, the payment across. Uh, these high costs have a significant impact on households that make cross-border payments. High costs for cross-border payments also affect smaller businesses that make infrequent global payments to suppliers. Reducing these cross-border payments could benefit economic growth, enhance global commerce, improve international payments, and reduce inequality. Uh, and this reducing the cross-border payments is a key reason why people are very interested in cryptocurrency. So let's talk about cryptocurrency. Uh, the paper now takes a look at digital assets, which is to talk about all sorts of uh, digital assets with money-like characteristics, whether they're a traditional cryptocurrency, a non-fungible token, or something else. Now, cryptocurrencies have not yet been widely adopted as a means of payment in the United States. Uh, there is a, for some cryptocurrencies, there's an extreme price volatility. Uh, you know, stable coins don't have the volatility, but they have some of the other limitations that cryptocurrencies have in general. Uh, many cryptocurrencies um, are highly risky for a wide range of reasons. Um, the President's Working Group on Financial Markets recently had a report on payment stable coins noting that the payment the stable coins because of the uh, less, lesser volatility are, uh, you know, and the idea that they're pegged to a particular asset uh, or a, a pool of assets allows them to be used for payments in a much more efficient approach than some other types of cryptocurrency. Um, and they, the, in this report, they comment on the fact that the previous report 
recommended that Congress act to enact a legislation that would ensure payment stable coins are subject to a consistent regulatory framework. Um, all right, so let's talk about a central bank digital currency. The Federal Reserve is considering how a central a CBDC would fit into the U.S. money and payments uh, approach. You know, and would it be better to other approaches that are currently used or could be used in the future? Uh, they define the central bank digital currency as a digital liability of the Federal Reserve that's widely available to the general public. Although one alternative would be to use the CBDC just in the banking system among banks and not to the general public. But for the purpose of this paper, we'll focus on a currency available to the general public. Uh, currently, physical currency, uh, you know, dollars, is, paper dollars are the only type of central bank money available to the general public. Um, like existing forms of commercial bank money and non-bank money, a CBDC would enable the general public to make digital payments. However, it wouldn't uh, require, would not require mechanisms like deposit insurance, nor would it depend on backing by an underlying asset pool. The CBDC will be the safest digital asset available to the general public with no associated credit or liquidity risk. So this is actually an interesting point here. They believe that a central bank di digital currency would be the safest digital asset available to the general public. So if that's true, presumably it would drive the other digital assets out of the marketplace. Um, the Federal Reserve, unless there's some other benefit those assets have, beyond uh, risk. So the, uh, the Federal Reserve will continue to explore a wide range of design options for a CBDC. While no decisions have been made on whether to pursue one, analysis to, to date suggests that a potential U.S. CBDC would best serve the needs of the U.S. by being privacy protected, intermediated, widely transferable, and identity verified. Uh, so what do they mean by that? They've got these four little things here, privacy protected, intermediated, widely transferable, and identity verified. So privacy protected, you know, they point out that protecting consumer privacy is critical. So they need to strike a balance between safeguarding the privacy rights of consumers while giving transparency to the police to, to deal with criminal activity. Uh, intermediated, Federal Reserve Act does not authorize Federal Reserve accounts for individuals, and such accounts would represent a significant expansion of the Federal Reserve's role in the financial system and the economy. So let's, let's explain that again. Remember, the Federal Reserve normally supports banks, and then you would have your account with your bank. So now all of a sudden, we're talking about the Federal Reserve issuing a cryptocurrency that anyone could get. So that's actually the Federal Reserve dealing with individuals now. Um, so what they're suggesting is an intermediated model where the private sector would offer the accounts of digital wallets to facilitate the management of CBDC holdings and payments. Uh, potential intermediaries would include the commercial banks and regulated non-bank financial service providers who would operate an open market for CBDC services. Um, all right, so let's think about what Pat is saying there. All right, so the private sector would offer accounts or digital wallets. So let's imagine that you have an account with a cryptocurrency exchange. Let's say, for example, you know, Kraken or Coinbase or something else. So what we're saying here is then that um, just like you might have Bitcoin in that account, you would have the Fed Reserve CBDC in that account. Or if it's a wallet, you know, just like you might have a Ledger uh, Nano wallet, you could then, and that Ledger Nano stores Bitcoin, you can now store these CBDCs in it. That's what they're saying. Although commercial banks and non-banks will offer services to individuals to manage their CBDC holdings and payments, the CBDC itself would be a liability of the Federal Reserve. Uh, an intermediated model would facilitate the use of the private sector's existing privacy and identity management frameworks, leverage the private sector's ability to innovate, and reduce the prospects for destabilizing disruption to the well functioning US financial system. So the Federal Reserve is going to launch the cryptocurrency, but you know, again, the private sector is producing wallets and exchanges and all of the other businesses that support that cryptocurrency, even though the, the Fed Reserve is the one who launched the cryptocurrency. All right, so that's what intermediated means. Let's take a look at transferable. For a central bank digital currency to serve as a widely accessible means of payment, it would need to be readily transferable between customers and different intermediaries. The ability to transfer value seamlessly between different intermediaries makes the payment system more efficient 
by allowing money to move freely through the economy. All right, so yeah, it needs to be transferable. Um, you know, just like the other cryptocurrencies are. Uh, that's pretty straightforward. Uh, identity verified. Financial institutions in the United States are subject to rules that are designed to combat money laundering and the financing of terrorism. Central bank digital currency would need to be designed to comply with these rules. In practice, this would mean that a CBDC intermediary would need to verify the identity of a person accessing CBDC, just as other banks and other uh, financial institutions uh, currently verify the identities of their customers. So this would basically be your know your customer anti-laundering anti -money laundering, uh, laws, uh, KYC AML, that banks currently have to deal with and cryptocurrency exchanges have to deal with. And so they're saying that if you're a CBDC intermediary and you're creating and you're in one of these exchanges, you have to verify the identity of the people using this currency to make sure it's not being used for money laundering or terrorism financing. All right, so let's, that's the uh, four characteristics. Let's take a look at the uses and functions of the CBDC. Uh, CBDC transactions would need to be final and complete in real time, allowing users to make payments to one another using a risk free asset. Yeah, it's basic uh, cryptocurrency stuff. Individuals, businesses, and governments could use the CBDCs to make purchases, pay bills, collect taxes, make benefit payments, and so on. Um, additionally, you could potentially program these things, deliver payments at certain times. Yeah, it's a whole smart contracts idea. Uh, potential benefits to CBDC could potentially serve as a new foundation for the payment system and a bridge between different payment services, both legacy and new. Could also maintain the central, safe, trusted central bank for money in a rapid digitizing economy and safely meet future needs and demands for payment services. So it's a broad based digital money that's free from credit risk and liquidity risk. It gives you a safe foundation for private sector innovations to meet current and future needs and demand for payment services. Um, you know, it talks about the fact that all the current options for private uh, cryptocurrencies, including stable coins and other cryptocurrencies, require mechanisms to reduce liquidity risk and credit risk. But all those mechanisms are imperfect and the Federal Reserve thinks the US CBDC would be better than all the other currencies that are out there. Um, the CBDC might also help to level the playing field and payment innovation for private sector firms. For smaller firms, the cost and risk of issuing a safe form of private money may be too expensive. A CBDC could overcome this barrier and allow private sector innovators to focus on access services, distribution methods, and related service offerings. So instead of creating a new currency, you can build stuff around the currency. Uh, finally, a CBDC might generate new capabilities to meet the evolving speed and efficiency requirements of the digital economy. Uh, the CBDC could be programmed to deliver payments at certain times, used to carry out micropayments, uh, which traditional payment systems aren't really designed to facilitate, and so on. Uh, potential to streamline cross-border payments by using new technologies, just like cryptocurrency could be more efficient for this. The CBDC could be more efficient for cross-border payments. Could also support the uh, dollar's international role. You know, instead of worrying about the dollar being replaced by cryptocurrencies, this would increase the dollar's role as being the predominant form of currency that's in use. Finally, financial inclusion. Uh, promoting financial inclusion is a high priority for the Federal Reserve. Um, and this could reduce common barriers to financial inclusion and could lower transaction costs, which could be helpful for low-income households. And it could extend public access to safe central bank money. Yes, yeah, cash is currently the only central bank money that's available to the general public. However, you know, in some places, digital payments are rapidly supplied in cash. And so we'd like to make uh, you know, central bank money available for these digital payments. There are some risks and policy considerations. Um, there would be changes to the financial sector. Uh, banks currently rely on deposits to fund their loans. Um, a widely available CBDC could substitute for commercial banking money and impact banks. Um, you know, it'd be partic particularly attractive to risk averse users. And this could result in, you know, runs on financial firms and banks where they want to move all their money into CBDCs. Um, you know, how effective, how would this impact, you know, what will be the impact of this on monetary policy? Uh, you know, and the, you know, and Fed Reserve rate changes, 
Um, it could have a significant impact. Um, and they go through and talk about that. Uh, there could be foreign demand for CBDCs. Um, you know, one of the issues is to think about how is this going to affect privacy and data protection, prevention of financial crimes, you know, consumer privacy, uh, prevention of financial crimes, um, fi uh, terrorism financing, money laundering, and so on. Um, how would you uh, create your digital currency in such a way that it's secure, you know, with operational resilience, uh, cybersecurity, and so on? Uh, threats to the existing payment services would apply to a CBDC as well. How would you defeat hackers from hacking the, the banking system? You know, they talk about the need to research this. Um, all right. And so those were the various topics that were brought up by the paper. Paper closes with uh, requesting uh, inputs from others. You know, you know, you can give your own comments on this paper uh, and send in your comments to the Federal Reserve. You know, this would represent a significant innovation in the American monetary system, and the Federal Reserve wants people to send your comments in. So please submit your comments by May 20th, four months from now, using a form available at the federalreserve.gov. Um, all public questions and comments uh, will be made available publicly. And they're not going to be edited, but they'll just be reproduced as they were submitted. Uh, but they'll remove information for, if necessary for technical reasons or sensitive information. Um, and then they uh, talk about the questions they had, you know, what additional potential benefits or risks may exist they didn't talk about. Uh, is there, are there better ways to achieve these benefits? Um, how is it going to impact monetary policy and so on? How will it affect uh, financial stability in the financial sector? What tools can be used to mitigate the uh, adverse impacts or increase the benefits? Uh, if cash usage goes away and is replaced by these uh, cryptocurrency payments, whether it's CBDC or so on, how does that going to impact things? You know, how will cross-border payments evolve? How should other, how should, uh, if other countries want issue CBDCs, how should that influence whether the U.S. does the same thing? Are there additional ways to manage the risks? Are there additional ways to handle privacy, operational and cyber resiliency, and so on? Um, should a CBDC pay interest? Should the amount of the CBC held by a single end user be subject to quantity limits? Uh, what type of firm should serve as intermediaries? Should it have offline capabilities? Um, should it be designed to achieve transferability? Are there additional design principles that should be considered? Uh, then they have some appendixes. They talk about their current research. They talk about uh, different types of money. Um, and then they talk about um, access to money and how people get access to money uh, through the financial system. So, all, and then they have their, all their, their references, you know, various uh, analysis. For, um, some of them are just on the monetary system and some of them are diving specifically into CBDCs. All right, so that's a brief look at uh, um, this month's uh, money and payments paper on the future of central bank digital currencies from the Federal Reserve. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of the Understanding Crypto System. Tune in next time. We'll dive deeper into Ethereum.